Jared Kuri, supporting the cybersecurity ecosystem in the Mexican educational sector. A round of applause for Fernando Aranda. So let's what we wanted to present here is our team uh, that support uh, uh, cybersecurity in Mexico. Let me give you the background. In late 2018, we were created as a CSERT, and uh, starting in 2019, uh, in, uh, when we the, the, we had a workshop organized by LACNIC and the uh, uh, Universidad de Veracruzana, and it was there that we started training people formally, creating our uh, team for incident response. And that was a hallmark, because not only were we born uh, in that workshop, but other sea uh, um, certs in the region, too. Then, uh, with uh, the support of uh, the CDN network, we started our first steps to define uh, our target community and the model that we would use. Now, why should we have a sea cert of uh, the RNA? AI. Well, we had uh, the, there is an infrastructure that connects most of the uh, um, uh, superior education uh, institutions in Mexico, supported by government initiatives. They, there was Walmer malware uh, crossing the academia, uh, the academic re uh, network, and there were attacks to infrastructure that we were not managing at the time, and those were some of the reasons why we created the CSERT, or we promoted the creation of the CSERT, nor did we participate with other national uh, um, networks uh, in the country that we were aware of their CSERT, but we were not collaborating with them at the time. And we were aware of incidents that uh, our institutions had suffered, but uh, there was no way we could help them. However, in 2020, there was a change in the environment. At national level, the government uh, uh, quit uh, uh, supporting connectivity um, of uh, the Mexican universities. There was a boom of the internet, increasing the attack surface. Everybody had to go home. So, what uh, used to be more or less control in the university uh, campuses now, with everybody at home, it was no longer possible to control everything the way we used to. Of course, there was a greater risk for cyber attacks. So we saw many challenges for the institutions that had appeared, and that led us to change the original strategy of RSC cert And the first thing that we did uh, after this change after changing the environment, was uh, we said, well, let's see where we stand in terms of cybersecurity at our universities to see how we can help. So we conducted an exercise with two phases. One was qualitative. We organized three uh, focus group sessions with the support of a consultant expert on these issues, and we um, uh, invited about 20 uh, universities, uh, large, um, uh, medium-sized, and small universities. And we talked to the people, to the uh, CISOs and the people responsible for security to learn firsthand the problems they were facing. Yeah. So after that, we did the second part of the exercise, which was a quantitative part, where we conducted a survey. We invited 192 
higher education schools to respond. We had 171 responses, about 90%. This survey consisted in three sections, was, was uh, inventory of resources and the activities of the cyber security areas. The second section was uh, on the relevance of communication and participation. And thirdly, the main problems they faced. The section on the main problems they faced is part of the uh, the result of the qualitative stage. And what we found was quite interesting because in the qualitative phase, we saw that 60 Two percent of the problems the organizations had was that the top management saw investment in security as an expense and not as an investment. So this has to do with what Imelda said in her presentation, because if, in fact, we don't have the awareness that we have to invent in cybersecurity. Well, this is a point. One of the other things we received uh, feedback on was the lack of budget. But this is also linked to the view of the top management who sees cybersecurity as an expense. This also speaks about skilled human resources. In the inauguration session, we heard about the lack of training. And in fact, there is a lack of human resources, of skilled human resources. And this was done by the universities. These replies were provided by the universities. And then the lack of resources is also an issue. Some only had two people for cybersecurity. The larger ones had 40, a staff of 14 for cybersecurity, others had 12, but the majority had only two experts on cybersecurity. And one of the other issues that came up was the lack of standards or regulations. And they told us that many organizations had policies in place, but these were not applied rigorously. They told us that the director comes and says, we need to authorize this person to do this. But according to the policy, this was not the case. But if the director came and said, well, you have to give permission to this person, so that is where the regulation was not respected. So in that sense, these were not applied strictly. Now, regarding the quantitative phase, we saw very interesting facts. We see that on the left, you have those who do not have these things. So 93% told us that they do not have a training or certification plan in cybersecurity, nor, neither for the board nor for the strategic past. So 90% doesn't have a training plan for the operational personnel. So we see, is training lacking? Yes, it is lacking. But if we don't have a formal plan for people who then occupy those positions can then support this part, well, we won't be able to grow. They haven't implemented a risk management process. 75% does not have an IT security department. 70% does not carry out pen testing at least once a year. They don't have risk management plans. So really, we were quite surprised by this information obtained from this survey. So once we had all this information, we added one further objective to our incident response team, namely to provide the institutions with services, tools, and training in cybersecurity. In order to help the universities, we developed four lines of action, four strategic lines of action in order to mitigate 
the situation and to contribute to figuring out a solution to the challenges. So we defined four lines. One is developing tools. The other one has to do with capacity building, three services, and four partnerships. The first line had the objective of developing and providing tools, particularly open source tools, to assist to mitigate these cyber risks. Because in the survey, we detected that there are many organizations, particularly the smaller ones, that have no tool at all, neither for monitoring purposes nor for perimeter security. So they have absolutely nothing. So. In this case, what we did was to customize some of the already existing tools to packet these, to prepare virtual machines, and to deliver these already configured so that they could really implement these. And these are tools that many of us are already familiar with. We also supported ourselves in initiatives such as VPN, which are specifically developed for the academia, and in collaboration with Red Cedia, which we selected the work of uh, Honeypots based on the FRIDA project, they invited us to participate in this project, and we started to develop a national university probe network, and also to detect the malware that goes through the networks of our members. So that at the university, we have four institutions that are in production, two are in the pilot stage, and we're now inviting more to join us in this probe network. So we're going to build a multidisciplinary analysis group that should be insta institutional to process all the data that is being obtained with these probes. The second axis has to do with capacity building. As we saw in the results of the survey, a large percentage of the personnel of the cybersecurity area and of the organization stated that they had no training of no kind whatsoever. So here we developed this axis. So what we did is to organize the training courses of the network itself. We increased the number of courses and at the same time, through partnerships established with some enterprises, we are an academia of the EC Council, so we have some training lines specifically with them. Our partners, which are the higher education organizations, can use the capacity building options and can obtain certification at very accessible costs and specialize in some fields. We are also part of the Fortinet Academia. Any of our members can request the certification voucher fee of charge from the NC4 layer to the NC7 layer, and then have access to the materials free of charge as well as to the vouchers, the number of vouchers that each of our members might need. It could be just any amount. And right now, we are in contact with Cisco and with Comtaya in order to become part of their groups and therefore support the universities. We also designed a one-day capacity building program. This is a one week. It's an investment of one week in cybersecurity training. So what we ask the participants and the facilitators is not to have just presentations. These are workshops. These are certification courses. These are workshops that are free of charge for the personnel of the IT area. These activities are focused on these areas. They can work. The first activity was organized in 2021. This was done virtually because of the pandemic. 
and these were, this was a six-day training, eight hours every day. The second training took place in person last year at the University of the state of Jalisco in Guadalajara. There we had three rooms dedicated for the sessions. We, these were the number of participants. And over the two-day activity, we also were joined by national networks from Latin America who also provided experts on the different topics. So we dealt with topics, for example, how to conduct vulnerability tests, incident management, certification courses from Easy Council. So a whole set of specific training activities on cybersecurity. In addition to that, we provide follow-up to those organizations that wish to set up the incident response teams. Now we are supporting one of the universities in the creation of the response team. We also support the national law enforcement with whom we have an excellent relationship regarding the implementation of the national protocol on cybersecurity. This has already been published in the official gazette. So all the response teams should really adhere to this. And then we have another section which has to do with services. We saw that many institutions have limited personnel specialized in cybersecurity. So we offered services from the network to those organizations who did not have such personnel. We assisted them in conducting vulnerability tests if required by them. We have carried out some of these. We also organized awareness raising sessions. This is important because the awareness raising sessions are not only addressed at the end users, which is one of the weakest links in the chain, but also this is also addressed at the experts because we sometimes think that the people who work in security don't need awareness raising, but they do really need this. We also did a maturity test based on ISO's 27,000 and some other things such as the deployment of EduRoam and technical assistance regarding connectivity. This is a result of some of the vulnerability tests, tests that we carried out. And then we have the last axis, which is that of partnerships in the field of cybersecurity. We cannot do things in isolation. We have to have partners, and these partnerships are very important. So here, for example, we have partnerships, for example, with LACNIC CSERT that has participated in our training activities. We already have collaboration with them, with the National Guards, as I mentioned, with CEDIA, with the National Network of Ecuador, and with some other organizations. Anuistic is one of uh, the associations at universities here in Mexico, so we work with them together on some of the topics that they are also promoting intensively. And then we have partnerships with vendors. For example, with Easy Council or Fortinet, with whom we have agreements, also with Kaspersky, not only for acquiring vendors, but with Fortinet, for example, we purchase devices at a reduced price for these organizations. And the same is with Kaspersky, but we also have an agreement for exchanging information in support of the CSERT. And now we also have some partnerships with other vendors and companies for exchanging information with other enterprises. So this is helpful for our users. The other collaborations we have had 
Uh, the following, we set up a regional cybersecurity group for the National Education and Research Networks of Latin America and the Caribbean. We started with four members, which was the network of Ecuador, Mexico, the network from Chile, and the network from Brazil. All these under the umbrella of Red Clara, which passes with joins all of them, but now we have national research and education networks from the following countries, Brazil, Ecuador, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Uruguay, and Cuba. And we meet on a monthly basis in this group. And we also develop lines of action, not only to support this cyber this is to support the cybersecurity ecosystem in the region algunas líneas we've already developed some lines we are working uh, with them uh, they have to do with training and some other issues we also participated <clears throat> Uh, we went to the TICAL meetings for the IT, um, um, uh, for the people working in IT in Latin America, and we are already taking this uh, at a regional level. We're going to see where these countries that are participating are standing, and so we take this proposal, and we already, we also um, had uh, focus group meetings. We uh, gave a presentation in November and in Montevideo. Y estamos ahorita. And right now we are analyzing the quantitative quantitative part that is going to be presented uh, later this month, and we're going to see how much progress we've made. In, uh, in the case of Mexico, we conducted a survey in 2021 and then another one in 2022. But in addition to that, we'll be able to learn how we are vis-a-vis um, -vis the rest of the uh, countries that participate in this program. So this is what we wanted to share with you. If you have any questions or any comments, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you. An applause for Fernando. I don't know whether anybody has any questions. Uh, nobody courageous in the chat. Any questions uh, in Zoom? Yes, Raghima Citerio is asking about the beginning of the circuit. Um, um, operations. How many people were there at the beginning and how many do you think are the necessary minimum to start? Well, that's a very good question. We started the c third with two people. At present, we are five. And what led us to creating c third was a Red Sedia, the equatorial um, network. They said they had two people and they told us that we could start with two people. We thought that we needed to invest a lot in technology, but no, we, we, we started with two people and now there's five of us. Okay. Any other questions? Well, if there are no more questions for Fernando, please, a round of applause. Thank you again for your presentation. Anyway, you can uh, uh, ask questions uh, during the